morning, North Hartford Baptist Church. He is risen. And praise the Lord, we are gathered in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, this morning to worship him and to lift high his name. We turn now to the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 28. We'll be reading from verses 1 through 10. As we read the narrative of the resurrection, we recognize that Jesus Christ is both the Lamb who was slain for sins and he is the risen Savior who is alive and who is seated at the right hand of the Father and is ruling and reigning. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to grow, go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray together. Well, oh, Father, we thank you this morning as we have gathered. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord, that we worship a risen Savior this morning. We thank you, God, for the resurrection hope that we have in Christ that delivers us from sin and darkness. We thank you for the blood that was shed to pay for our sins. And we thank you, God, that your Son has risen from the dead. I pray that in this time now, as we gather together, you would fix our eyes and our hearts and our hopes on Christ Jesus. That the gospel would be proclaimed and would be rejoiced in that the eyes of our hearts would see clearly, God, the, the magnitude of what you have done for us in Christ and the eternal, life-changing hope that is ours forever in him. Lord, I pray that your spirit would work through the word that is proclaimed, through the truths that we sing. May we be molded, Lord, this morning into the likeness of our risen Savior. I pray this in his name. Amen.
I have a reading from Acts 2, verses 22 to 36. It's a lengthy passage, so I encourage you to turn there. That's Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 36. The resurrection of Christ is the visible, historical proof that Christ's salvation is real. And we serve a living Savior who's ministering to us even as we speak, ministering to us from heaven. Acts 2, verses 22 to 36. This is a portion of the first sermon preached in the church age. Jesus rose, he ministered on earth for 40 more days, then he ascended into heaven, was seated at the right hand of God, and then 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit to begin building his church and advancing the kingdom of God on earth. This is a portion from Peter's sermon on that day of Pentecost. Verse 22 in Acts chapter 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your holy, infinite in power, infinite in wisdom. Almighty Creator and gracious Redeemer, we praise you. We thank you for all good things come from you. Thank you for life. Thank you for provision. Thank you for eternal life and the hope that you've given us through Christ. Thank you for being with us during difficult times, for giving us strength to persevere, for giving us faith to get through. Thank you for moving us forward in our sanctification by this great work of your Spirit to conform us to the likeness of Jesus, we thank you. Father, we pray for the lost, that you would save them, for the saved, that you would strengthen them, for the church, that you would build us up in the unity and the knowledge and the maturity that is found only in Jesus Christ who lives in heaven. Father, we lift these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to stand, church, as we together sing the gospel.
The reading before our offering comes from Mark 12, 41 to 44. That's Mark 12, 41 to 44. It's a great passage. It's a great reminder that it's not the amount that we give that pleases God, but it's the heart with which we give it. Um, here's from Mark 12, verse 41. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. And many rich people put in large sums. Then a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity and the possibility that we could give back to you. And we're asking you to use these, king, these, uh, these funds for your kingdom. We're fully expecting, fully trusting that you and your providence, by your spirit, you'll use these funds to advance the gospel, to both start and strengthen biblical churches, and to help the needy in different ways. Uh, offer your kingdom, offer your glory. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. don't know who this applies to, um, but regarding the flowers, the lilies have been put outside that door in that little hallway out there. The aroma was overwhelming, so in order that you could have some preaching today, we've removed the lilies. Um, well, it's great to see you today. It's always great um, to be able to get together and worship God together. Amen. And indeed, as those who've received the Spirit, all of our lives are to be lived in honor and worship of God. But it's great to be able to come today, uh, to come together as God has called us and worship together. The topic today is a great salvation. And the passage is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. That's 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 to 5, a great salvation. Boy, it's so difficult to summarize the great salvation that God has given us because there's so many wonderful aspects to it, so many dimensions, so many layers. But one way to sum up this great salvation that God has given us is life in fellowship with God that will never end. That's one of my favorite ways to summarize salvation. It's life in fellowship with God that will never end which is so far better than life without fellowship with God that will never end. A great salvation, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5. Let's begin in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's pray. Father, I pray and we pray that you would help us in this time as we come to your word, seeking your help. 
that indeed in your great mercy and in your great power and wisdom you would minister to our hearts through your word, by the working of your spirit. Let Christ be magnified in our hearts. Stand before you as one who is fully aware that I can do nothing apart from you and your spirit, including preaching your word. So I pray that you would let the preaching be spirit-filled and spirit-led, but I also pray, and we also pray, that the hearing of your word would be spirit-led and spirit-filled, that in this room, during this time, from this passage, Christ would be exalted before us, that we would see him by faith, that we would believe in him, that we would love him, that we would find peace and contentment and joy and sanctification in Him and Him alone. Show us, God, this great salvation You've given us in Christ. It's in His name we ask. Amen. A great salvation is life and fellowship with God that will never end. I just want to begin by pointing out this one phrase in the middle of verse 3. You can look down and see if you can find it. Born again. Born again. Born again to what? Born again to a great salvation. Born again to life in fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 3. John the Apostle writes, Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship. Salvation is about a relationship with God. John 13, 20 Jesus says, whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. Again, salvation is about a relationship with God by way of a relationship with Jesus. Fellowship with Jesus is fellowship with the Father. Receiving Jesus is receiving the Father. One more. I mean, there's so many of these. I had to really... Um, just cherry pick a few. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says that God has, quote, called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, end quote. Fellowship, relationship, receiving God, receiving Jesus. Life and fellowship with God that will never end. That's the great salvation. But we've got to be born again to receive that salvation. We've got to be born again. We'll talk about that phrase later when we get to it. The first thing, now that we're into the body of the message, the first thing I want us to look at is a great God. That's number one, a great God. Look at verse 3 with me again, how it begins. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first key word in the passage is God. Blessed be God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice what kind of statement this is. This is a word of praise. This is a word of blessing. It would be called a doxology. Blessed be God. That's the heart that we should have in all of life. A heart that speaks a word of blessing to God, not cursing God, not mocking God, not rejecting God, not slandering God. That would be easy to do. That's the easy thing to do, to go with the stream of the culture and world around us. But God has changed our hearts so that in our hearts we speak a word of blessing to God. We bless His name. We praise His name. We worship God. And by His grace and by His Spirit, we strive to obey God. Try to strive to obey God without His grace and without His Spirit. We just become self-righteous religious hypocrites. By His grace and by His Spirit, by God's work within us, we strive to obey Him. It all starts with God. And in our hearts and in our lives, it all starts with blessing God rather than cursing God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's just where we have to be in our hearts. 
If anything else in our lives is going to be on the right road, it's going to start there. With that posture, with that attitude in our hearts, it speaks a word of blessing to God. It recognizes the good things of God. God, the creator of the world. God, the giver of life. God, the standard of all that is right and good. I know man wants to be the standard of all that's right and good. We can remember this about ourselves before we were saved. We thought we were the standard of all that is right and good. But God and God alone is the standard of what is right and what is good, of what is pure, of what is ethical, of what is just. God is the standard. God is the source. God is the measuring stick of all that is right and good. So we bless his name, not our own. God is holy. He's exalted above everything else. He created everything else. Therefore, he is exalted above everything else. God is categorically different than everything else. That just means he's in a different category. And he's infinitely superior to everything else. God is holy, exalted, ruling over everything. And he is a righteous judge And he also is a gracious redeemer. There's so much we could say about God. The whole Bible's about God. To give us a true and saving, wonderful, blessed knowledge of God that we wouldn't have without Scripture. God, blessed be God. But it also says, Father, blessed be the God and Father. We're going to talk a lot about the salvation that we have by virtue of Jesus Christ. But it's the Father who planned the whole thing out. It's the Father who sent Jesus to save us. So whenever we're talking about Jesus, and whenever we're talking about what Jesus did to save us, and what Jesus continues to do in the world to save sinners, we must always be going back to this. The Father set this whole thing in motion from all eternity. It's the Father who sent the Son. It's the Son who accomplished salvation, And it's the Father and the Son who then gave the Holy Spirit. Blessed be. Blessed be. It's almost an understatement, is it? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that uh, three-word phrase, Lord Jesus Christ, that could be a whole sermon in and of itself. And it would work out nicely because it's three points. Lord. It's a... it's uh, a version of God's name. In the Old Testament, it would have been Yahweh. In the New Testament, that's, you see Lord. It's just another name for God. Jesus, which literally means the Lord is salvation. But it says Lord Jesus Christ, which means the anointed one. And it refers to God's anointed king who saves us from our enemies, who redeems us from sin, who saves us, delivers us from death, who rescues us from the judgment of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, our King and Savior. This all begins with a great God. That's number one. It all begins with a great God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, this great God has a great mercy. In fact, you see that phrase. That's where our I got this adjective great for the title, a great salvation, because of, if you go on in verse 3, it says this, according to his great mercy. And then everything else that Peter will write flows from that. It's all the fleshing out of God's great mercy. It's all the expounding, opening up this treasure chest of what? God's great mercy. According to God's great mercy, dot, dot, dot. Based on mercy, Dot, dot, dot. A great God of great mercy. Exceedingly good. That's what great means, right? You have bad food that you want to spit out. You have tolerable food. You have good food and you have great food. Great food. Exceedingly good. Beyond what you can measure or put into words. Great mercy. According to his great mercy. Well, that's a phrase that captures my heart. The mercy of God. I know exactly where I would be without God's mercy. Enslaved to sin. In love with wickedness. And given to corruption. And heading 
for damnation. Praise God for his great mercy. Biblically speaking, mercy has two dimensions to it. Number one, it's the holding back of punishment. That's showing mercy. It's the holding back of punishment. As parents, we want to discipline our children, and one of the ways we do that is by punishments, appropriate punishments to teach them right and wrong, to teach them that there's consequences. That's discipline. But one of the things we also need to teach our children about is mercy. So sometimes we hold back the punishment, and we teach them verbally about what mercy is. It's the restraining of a punishment that's deserved. It's the holding back of punishment. Another dimension of mercy is helping the helpless, helping the needy, feeding the hungry, comforting the lonely, helping those who cannot help themselves. God is a God who helps those who cannot help themselves. Fewer things are clearer in the Bible than this. God is merciful, and he calls us to be merciful. God is merciful, and he calls us to be merciful as representatives of him. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the, any guesses? Merciful. For they shall receive, any guesses? Mercy. Matthew 18, 27, uh, so here we go, a little bit of context. Matthew 18, this portion of it, Jesus tells the parable of a king who's settling all his debts. And one of the king's servant owes him more money than he could ever pay back in his lifetime. But he begs for forgiveness. He begs the king to erase the debt. What does the king do? The king, in mercy, erases the debt. Now, if you remember the story, that servant, he goes out. And now someone else owes him a debt much smaller than what he owed to the king. And this guy now is begging the first servant to forgive his debt, erase my debt. And in the story, in the parable, the one servant not only refuses, but grabs him by the neck, starts to strangle him. And what did the king do? The king took that first servant. And the king took that first servant, and he put him in prison until he could pay back what he owed, which was a debt that was too great. Matthew 18, 27, here's, here's the king forgiving the first servant. Out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. That's a nice picture. God's mercy forgives our debt. But now later in the story, Matthew 18, 32 and 33, after that servant went out and refused to forgive someone else's debt, here's what he says. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant in the same way I had mercy on you? Now what's the answer to that question? Yes, right. Yes, you should have. I mean, the Bible's so clear about this. God is merciful, and he calls us to be merciful. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even as we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Which is another way of saying, born again. Man, I can't wait till we get that section of the sermon, born again. We're dead in sins, dead in trespasses, alienated from God. But God, because, of his, because he's rich in mercy, because of his great love, exceedingly good love, love that abounds, doesn't just trickle down to us. God's love abounds to us, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. There's a great verse on this in, uh, in the book of 1 Peter 2. Turn, uh, just flip one page over, maybe two in your Bible, to 1 Peter 2.10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. One way to summarize Christians is that we are those who recognize that we need the mercy of God. 
those who've been changed by the mercy of God. So we can say, once we had not received mercy, but praise God, now we have received mercy. So we give God the credit for that, not ourselves. We give God the glory for that. We don't get the glory for that. On the final day, when Christ returns, it's the final judgment, the final resurrection. You receive final redemption. Right? On that day, Jesus Christ gets all the credit. Jesus Christ gets all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. We're trophies of his grace, it's been said multiple times. Salvation is a gift of mercy. The holding back of punishment and helping the helpless, helping needy sinners. Salvation is not a wage to be earned. It's a gift to be received. Now, a righteous judge does not find rapists and murderers innocent and then put them back on the street to continue to terrorize others. A righteous judge does not ignore crime. The Bible condemns that. A righteous judge does not ignore crime. He does not arbitrarily hold back punishment just so others will think that he's nice and friendly. That's not the kind of judge... We don't want to live in that city where all the judges just released all the criminals, all the rapists, all the murderers, all the arsonists. Just release them right back out on the street. Could you imagine? Now, if God is a righteous judge, how is it that he holds back punishment from sinners? If you, this is a central question of Scripture. If you, can, if you can get this question and get the answer to this question, you understand the gospel and the great salvation of God. How is it that God holds back punishment from sinners and remains righteous? Because doesn't that punishment have to be paid? God holds back punishment from sinners on the basis of Jesus' death in the place of sinners. This is the center of the gospel. The sun is the center of the solar system. The heart, your heart is the center of your cardiovascular system. The core of the earth is the center of the earth. Jesus' death in the place of sinners is the center of the Bible. It's the center of Christianity. It holds it all together. Everything else revolves around this. Jesus' death in the place of sinners. On the basis of Jesus' death in our place, God holds back punishment from us. We're in the gospel, in the scriptures... The message is not that just that God is so nice and so friendly, he just looks the other way. He just ignores your sin. Now, that's what we say. That's what the world says. Just let it go. No big deal. Nothing to see here. Corruption, rebellion, wickedness, evil, selfishness, greed, murder, slander, idolatry. Nothing to see here. God is nice. God is friendly. Everybody's okay. That's absurd. That's absurd. We're all accountable before God, and we've all sinned before God. We've all transgressed his holy law, his holy commandments, and the punishment for our crimes must be paid, and Jesus paid the penalty. He received the punishment for our crimes on the cross. It's on the basis of that that we could know God in a proper way. You know, if, if there's one word I would want to engrave or to ingrain in our minds about the meaning of the death of Christ. And you can do it in one word. One word engraved in our minds to always remember the meaning of the death of Christ. It would be this. Substitute. That's not even a difficult theological word, is it? That's an easy word. Everybody knows what the substitute is. It's someone who's in the place of someone else. That's it. That's the meaning of the cross. Jesus died in the place of others. He died in my place. He bore my sins in his body on that tree. 1 Peter 2.24 All who would believe in him, all who would turn and believe in Christ, he bore your sins in his body on that tree. That's where the penalty of our crimes is paid. You see this message. We'll do it quick. I'll try to do it quick, but not rush. Not sure if I'll be able to pull that off. But you have verses... Throughout 1 Peter, and that's the book we're in, verses throughout 1 Peter that put this meaning of the cross before us. First of all, look at chapter 1, verse 2. Toward the end of chapter 1, verse 2, you'll see this phrase, 
sprinkling with his blood. Sprinkling with his blood. That means washed with his blood, cleansed by his blood. It's almost a grotesque picture. Well, you have to understand the symbolism there. The blood's referring to Jesus' death. And the point is it's by virtue of Jesus' death that we're cleansed of our guilt. By virtue of Jesus' death, by his blood, we're cleansed from the corruption of sin. Then you go down to 221, chapter 2, verse 21, one page over. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. We'll just stop right there. I mean, there's more in that verse, but this is the phrase we're looking for. Christ also suffered for you. He suffered on our behalf, but it's more than that. He suffered in our place. You see, if Jesus didn't suffer for our sins, who would have to suffer for our sins? We would have to suffer for our sins. And then a couple verses down, chapter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body. You see the substitute? Our sins, his body, on the tree that's referring to the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then one more here. One more. 318. Flip over one more page. 318. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Do you see the substitute? Righteous for the unrighteous. That he might bring us to God that he might bring us to God that he might bring us into fellowship with God on the basis of his death we begin with a great God that's number one number two he's a great God of great mercy that's number two number three this God the great God of great mercy has worked a great work in our hearts we're back in chapter one back in chapter one back in our main passage still in verse three Right after, according to his great mercy, gets into the the action that God performed as a result of that mercy. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He's caused us to be born again. He's worked a great work in our hearts, and that's where we're born again. That doesn't happen on the outside. No amount of outward religion can produce that. No amount of good works can produce that. No amount of intellectual knowledge about the Bible can produce that. In our hearts, we're given new life in Christ, born again. He's caused us to be born again. I didn't cause myself to be born again. You think I have the supernatural power of God to cause myself to be born again? If I were left to my own devices, it would just be sin, 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 sin. That's what I cause. God has to cause new life in Christ. He has caused us to be born again. That's first grade grammar right there, brothers and sisters. I don't know why I nod my head like that. That's first grade grammar. The subject is he. The verb is caused. He caused us to be born again. That's why all the songs of redemption are songs about God and how great he is and not about ourselves and how great we are. Salvation is supposed to make us humble, brothers and sisters, not proud. It's supposed to make us humble. It's not supposed to make us look down on others. It's supposed to make us look down on ourselves as helpless sinners who are trusting only in Christ and his mercy, grace, and power. Caused us to be born again. That means to receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. There you go, there's the definition. Born again, what does that mean? It means to receive the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. How do I get the Holy Spirit? Through faith in Jesus Christ. How am I get born again? Through faith in Jesus Christ. How do I receive this great salvation? Through faith in Jesus Christ. How do I get the forgiveness of sins? Through faith in Jesus Christ. Born again. Our first birth was a physical birth. Born again is the spiritual birth. First birth, physical birth, born again, spiritual birth. If all I have is my first birth, I'm outside of fellowship with Jesus. It's my second birth, it's my new birth that's brought me into fellowship with Jesus. 
what you need is two births. Now, you all have the first birth, but do you have the second birth? Do you have the new birth? So I don't have the new birth. How do I get that new birth? Through faith in Jesus. No hoops to jump through. Just in your heart, humble yourself before God, and on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection, put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're born again. You're born again. In the first birth, you enter this world. In the second birth, you enter the kingdom of God. After the first birth, your eyes can see the world. After your second birth, you can see the world as it really is. You can interpret things properly. You can see yourself as you really are. You have a right view of God, a right view of mankind, a right view of the future. After the second birth, we receive new eyes, spiritual eyes. Jesus said in John 3, 7, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born again. It's talking about a change inwardly. It's talking about receiving the Holy Spirit through faith in Christ. God has worked a great work in our hearts. God can work that same great work in your heart this morning through faith in Jesus Christ. A great God of great mercy who's worked a great work in our hearts. Number four, therefore we have a great hope. We have a great hope. This almost is the main point. That more is said about this in our passage than anything else, this great hope. Now there's one phrase you'll see in verse 3, right after born again. Born again to what? Born again to a living hope. To a living hope. Not a dead hope, but a living hope. Because it's a hope that's rooted in Christ, and Christ is living. He's alive. The, the world offers dead hopes. The world offers counterfeit hopes. The world offers hopes, superficial hopes, that will that we'll, we'll, we will all lose one day everything we could gain in this world from the counterfeit hopes of this world, the dead hopes that do not last. But Christ is living, and our hope in him is a living hope. But then all of verse 4 explains, or at least summarizes, what this hope ultimately is. Again, this would be another verse. Where this, would be, I guess, would be a four-point sermon. Verse 4, to an inheritance, that's something you're going to receive. To an inheritance that's imperishable, uh, so it's not like things in this world. Things in this world are perishable. These bodies are perishable. Our treasures are perishable. To an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, that tells you also it's not of this world. Things in this world are defiled. I am defiled. Our words are defiled. This is undefiled. To an inheritance... That's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Unfading, it doesn't lose its value. It doesn't get, like, it doesn't get boring over time. Right? Unfading, kept in heaven for you. Boy, what an encouraging phrase. This glorious inheritance, not just that it exists, but that it's kept in heaven for us. Now, who's doing the keeping? God is doing the keeping. We're not doing the keeping. Again, it's kept in heaven. And we're not in heaven, so we can't be doing the keeping. Amen? Kept for us. He died for us. He's keeping our inheritance for us. Our salvation, therefore, our assurance, our confidence, which is what hope is, confidence on what God has promised. Confidence is all based on Christ from the first to the last. He's the Alpha, he's the Omega. He gets it started, he finishes it. He finishes it to perfection. All of our salvation is based on Christ and his grace and his power and his faithfulness. All of verse 4 flushes out a little bit this living hope. A little bit of meditation for personal application. What is the purpose of God's word in our lives? If you had to boil it down, what is the purpose of God's word in our lives in the big picture? What's the purpose of the gospel? What's the practical relevance of the word of God? There's really two broad categories for this. Number one, to save us and change the way we live now. That's number one. Practical relevance for this life. 
The word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to save us and change how we live now, which means we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for God. We no longer live for the world, but we live for Jesus. That's one aspect of the practical relevance of Scripture. The other aspect is this, to prepare us for eternity. To prepare us for eternity. Life continues after the soul leaves the body. Are you with me? So the practical relevance of Scripture is to change how we live now. Absolutely, we have to understand that as Christians. We're not just floating through life waiting for the afterlife. The Bible changes how we live now, but the Bible also prepares us for eternity. For when we meet our maker. For when we stand before God. The storyline of scripture is uh, it's a, it's a big book. There's a lot of stuff in there. But the basic storyline is simple. There's a final judgment coming. There's a final judgment coming. And on the other side of that judgment is... A new heavens and new earth where sin and all of its effects will be completely eradicated. All right, final judgment is coming. And on the other side of that final judgment is the new heavens and new earth where sin will be completely eradicated and all the effects of sin will be completely eradicated. Now the question of scripture, the storyline of scripture is when that final judgment comes, who will be spared and make it into the new heavens and new earth? That's the great salvation. That's the great inheritance. That's the glorious hope that we have in Christ. Who will be saved? Who will be spared? Who will be delivered when that judgment comes and inherit the earth? And it's the meek who will inherit the earth. Those who've been humbled by God to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Two aspects to change how we live and to prepare us for eternity. There's one other phrase that, from the passage that we could put onto this point of great hope. And it comes at the end of verse 5. Quote, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. A salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's referring to the final inheritance of salvation. That's referring to final glory. That's the hope that we have in Christ. The strong confidence in the future God has promised. Are you happy that God's in control of the future? Government's not in control of the future. Every decision, every election that happens in the, in the next five years could be exactly the way that you want it to be. Exactly the way that we would pray that it would turn out. But still... Our hope is in God. Only God controls the future. Salvation. Salvation, a, end of verse 5, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That, um, that doesn't mean that salvation has not been revealed at all yet. Of course, salvation has been revealed. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to say, today we have salvation. That is just referring to when, when the results of salvation in Christ are fully manifest, fully revealed. Salvation, it literally means to be saved from danger or death. It's talking about the salvation of our souls. What, no matter what the world around us says, you do have a soul. You're not just a bunch of molecules, biological matter with no meaning, with no purpose, with no soul, just floating through this random universe. You have a soul. You have a soul. And we're talking about the salvation of the soul Salvation has a minus and a plus. Did you know that salvation has a minus and a plus? That means uh, stuff's taken away, but also stuff is given. Right? Stuff's taken away, but also things are given as gifts. The minus of salvation is the guilt of our sin is taken away. Praise God. I'm so glad God forgave me my sin. Uh, the guilt of sin is taken away. Slavery to sin is taken away. I'm so happy I'm not a slave to sin anymore. Now, I sin. I still, sin still lives within me, but sin is not my master. Jesus Christ is my master, my living Lord and master. Um, taking away the guilt of sin, taking away slavery to sin, and taking away the judgment of God. And what's the plus? What's the add? Eh, salvation isn't just making us blank slates. Right, it's giving us things, too. It's bestowing upon us gifts. Oh, we already said fellowship with God. That's where the whole thing began. Life and fellowship with God that will never end. But there are different aspects to that. What's the plus? 
Well, a right standing before God, to stand before him holy and righteous. That's given to us. The indwelling Holy Spirit, that's a gift that comes with salvation. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't love God. You ever think about that? We may think we love God. We may do things to make us feel like we love God. But without the Holy Spirit, there can be no true love and adoration for God in our, in our hearts and lives. We need the Holy Spirit. That's a gift. And then, of course, just mentioned a little bit ago, the resurrection body and the new heavens and the new earth. That's the ultimate plus. That's the final add. That's that last gift that's bestowed upon us. That's salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Oh, man, I'm so bad at gauging, like, how long a sermon is going to be in my notes. Like, right here in my notes, I have, like, eight passages about salvation. <laughs> like, in my mind when I was writing this up, it's, okay, read through these great passages about salvation. I don't have the time to do that, but I'll read one of them. Luke 19, 10, Jesus says he came to seek and save the lost. That's what he came for. That's his job, to look for lost people and to save the souls of lost people. He came to seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus was about. That's what we need to be about, seeking and saving the lost. That's what God is about through us. It's probably the way to say that, the right way to say that. As his church, as his people, as his kingdom manifest on earth, God is working in us and through us to seek and save the lost, to reconcile sinners to himself. Number five, number five, all this is the result of a great miracle. Three, verse three, still in verse, are we still in verse three? Well, we, we cheated ahead to look at verse 4 and 5. Verse 3, th- look at all this. Uh, th- look at this. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the big miracle that's on everyone's mind today. Resurrection Sunday. This is all the result of this great miracle. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection is not a big deal. Only because it happened and it's really wonderful and really powerful. Now it is wonderful and it is powerful and it did happen. But it's a big deal because of what it achieved. It's a big deal because of what it accomplished. It's a big deal because what it made possible for you and for me. Salvation. The foundation makes the whole house possible. And the resurrection of Christ makes this whole salvation possible. If Jesus is dead, he cannot bring the great mercy of God into our lives. If Jesus is dead, he cannot work a great work in our hearts, giving us new life by the Spirit. If Jesus is dead, he cannot give us the confidence of a great hope for the future. But Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive, actively saving sinners by the Word and the Spirit. And because he lives, you can have confidence of a great hope for the future. And because he lives, he has worked a great work in our hearts, giving us new life by the Spirit. And because he lives, Jesus has brought the mercy of God into our lives. Praise God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's not a religious idea. He's not merely a moral example. Jesus is a living Savior. And number six, whoever believes in him is guarded by a great power. The very beginning of verse five, who by God's power, I feel like I said something about that already, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. How are they being guarded? Is it by God's power or is it through faith? Yes. You're being guarded by God's power through faith. As we continue to look to God and trust in his power to guard us, his power guards us, but it's through faith. The persevering power of God is experienced through faith. It's the same way being born again is experienced, through faith. It's the same way growing in holiness is experienced, through faith. It's the same way enduring suffering is experienced, through faith in Jesus Christ, a living Savior, through faith. God guarded by God's power through faith. Final statement. It's so encouraging to me and it's so intriguing to me. This picture that this passage has just put before us that Jesus is in heaven guarding our inheritance. But he also is in our hearts 
guarding us till we receive that inheritance. How amazing is that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you for the new birth. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for faith. Thank you for keeping our keeping this great inheritance that Jesus won on our behalf. Thank you for keeping us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray today that you would save the lost. We pray today that you would strengthen the saved, sanctify the saved. Show us Christ in our hearts. Father, we are praying that you would fill our hearts with faith in Christ, that we might know you and experience what it means to have salvation through faith in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. to stand as we sing together and rejoice in Christ the Lamb who is risen.
announcements just a reminder that we're not meeting for evening worship tonight and also the church office will be closed tomorrow if anyone needs to respond to the message in any way if you want to study the gospel more talk about salvation talk about faith in christ just come see me you can see jason or pastor anthony is back in the lobby as well and uh to guests we're glad that you joined us today want to let you know that you are always 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 welcome here we do the same thing every week. We pray together, we sing together, we share fellowship and try to encourage each other, and we sit under the preaching of the word and the heralding of Jesus Christ because that's what we need and that's what God has called us to do. So just want to let you know you're welcome any Sunday to join us and look in the bulletin or our website for other ministries as well. I um, want to close us with a doxology from uh, Revelation 5, verses 12 to 13. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Go in the grace of God. <laughs>